All right, so Proverbs chapter 3, if you remember last week, we did the first portion of it, the first dozen or so verses. We read verses 13 and 14, but that's where we're going to pick back up. So look at verse number 13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Now I remind you, all throughout Proverbs, you're going to see a connection between wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. I believe one builds upon the other. You start with some knowledge, then you understand what to do with the knowledge, and wisdom is when you enact it. All of that goes together. We looked at the verses that talk about the fear of the Lord begins, is the beginning, and, and all of those verses are tied together in various locations through Proverbs. So always remember that as you're reading Proverbs. Be on the lookout for those three words. A lot of times you'll find two of them paired together in a verse, and you see that here. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that get understanding. Listen, true joy, true happiness can only be found by having the Lord Jesus Christ. And then as a Christian, true joy and true happiness can only be found by obeying the Lord Jesus Christ, by keeping His commandments, you know, obeying His law. In 1 Peter 1, he says that ye rejoice with joy, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. In the soul we rejoice with joy that's unspeakable. And when we go out and preach the gospel to somebody and they get it, they understand who Jesus is, that He is God, that He died for their sins, right? When they understand these things and they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they choose to put their trust and they're saved. And it's like, it's like a burden is gone. Yeah. They get it. It makes sense. Every other method they've tried is difficult. You know, putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ is an easy thing. Although, we, you know, we know there are people that will not do that. And they will never have true joy. They will never have true happiness. And the book of Proverbs, I think, is written to saved people about how to have happiness in your life. Yeah. I want you to go to Job 28. We mentioned Job recently. You know, in James 5, it says, go to Job 28. In James 5, it says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, and that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. It's teaching that Job's wisdom helped him endure that tribulation. Right? In the book of James, he's referring back to Job, and he says, Ye count them happy which endure. True happiness is being able to go through a storm knowing that God is bigger than the storm. Knowing that no matter how bad you have it that day, God is bigger than that and God has given you so much more spiritually speaking. He's given you salvation. So true happiness is really found in spiritual things. And he brags on the patience of Job here. And we're going to look at that because we know that Job lost all of his earthly blessings, but he had eternal blessings and that gave him true joy throughout. Now where we're going here in Job chapter 28, this is a parable. This is a proverb. It's in the middle of, of what Job is saying. And we're going to look at verse number 12. It says, But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Did you know that Job wrote Proverbs? Did you know that he gave parables? Did you know that he gave us wisdom that is on par with what we have in the book of Proverbs? Why? Because he had that same spirit in him. Right? He had God's spirit that filled him with the word. So he says, where is wisdom? Right? Where are y'all going to get it? Where are you going to get wisdom tonight? If you go and ask the world, where are you going to get wisdom from? They're, well, I'm going to finish school and then I'm going to go to another school or I'll go to a trade school or maybe I'll get some fancy job with some big name company and then maybe they'll give me... I'm going to get some wisdom by hanging out with my friends that, that know a lot of stuff. Listen, that's not wisdom. That's earthly knowledge. True wisdom comes from the Lord God Almighty. Yeah. True wisdom comes from His Holy Spirit. And look, the more you obey Him, the more He's going to fill you with the Spirit, the more understanding He'll give you. So He's saying, where shall wisdom be found is the, Job, is the, is the question Job is answering here. And he, he says, where is the place of understanding? Man, look at verse 13. Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. It's not a fleshly thing. And man, by default, can't understand it. Right? These are spiritually discerned things. Verse 14. The depth saith, it is not in me. And the sea saith, it is not in me. It cannot be gotten for gold. Neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. You can't go down to the local college and say, here's a pound of gold. Give me some wisdom. 
Oh, they'll give you knowledge, all right? They'll give you some science, falsely so-called. They'll tell you to be proud of their sports team and be proud of yourself, but they're not going to teach you God's Word. Yeah. They're not going to teach you His law. They're not going to teach you the Gospel. So you can't go there and get wisdom. You can't just buy wisdom. The closest thing to buying wisdom is to get you a Bible. You can get that at the dollar store, yeah. right? You can go down to the dollar store and get a King James Bible and find some wisdom that God has for you. But if you're not saved, it won't do you any good. Look at verse 16. It cannot be valued with gold of Ophir or with the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it. And the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. He's giving all these examples of crystals and jewels and gold and silver and you can't exchange for it. There are people that have all of these things, gold, silver, and jewels, and they have zero wisdom. They're a fool. They're unsaved. They hate God. God looks down and says, you're a fool. I don't care how wise you are in this world. I don't care how prominent you are in this world. Without Jesus, you are a fool. And the Bible uses that comparison, especially in Proverbs, of the wise man and the fool. Now, obviously, we are still in the flesh. You can go back to the old man and you can act like a fool, even though you're saved. But Proverbs is here to warn us against doing just that. And it's telling us to not be a fool. We better not worry about chasing gold and silver. We need to chase the Word of God. We need to read the Word of God. We need to obey it. Look, what he, you can't just trade out for that. You can't go buy it. Verse 18, he says, No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. Hey, that sounds like Proverbs, doesn't it? Isn't that cool? Job has some Proverbs for us. Look at the next verse. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. Whence then cometh wisdom, and where is the place of understanding? He, he started, hey, so where is gold? If you can't buy it and it's not it, it's just laying on the ground, where are you going to get wisdom? Where is it at? How do you get it? It's not book smarts. It's not just knowledge alone. Look at verse 28 near the end of the chapter. Look what he says here. And unto man he saith, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Boy, if that doesn't sound like Proverbs, I don't know what does. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Go back to Proverbs chapter 3. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. When you want to start applying the knowledge that God gives you, stop doing the stupid stuff that's keeping you from being a good Christian, from being a profitable Christian, from being a productive member of God's, of God's army, if you will, of God's kingdom. Look, we're already in the kingdom to a certain extent. We're spiritually seated in heavenly places right now. What are you doing with the gifts and the talents and the resources that God has given you? Don't waste it away with the wrong priorities. Make the right priorities. Everything else will fall in order. Look at verse 14 where we left off. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. What's better, than, what's better than money and gold and silver? God's wisdom. It's God's wisdom is the best thing. Look, it says, She, speaking of wisdom, is more precious than rubies. And all the things that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. It, it, the Bible's teaching here there is peace by finding wisdom. Once you have godly wisdom in your heart, which is to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ, obey the Holy Spirit that's inside of you, hearken unto His Word, learn His Word, study His Word, find out what God wants you to do in life, and then just do it. When you do that, it will be like pleasantness unto you. Your ways will be peaceful. You'll be at more peace with your spouse, with your boss, because you've changed priorities. You know, I mean, if you're, you're, if you're having problems at work, maybe it's because you're too worried about a raise and you need to be worried about pleasing God and He'll take care of that raise. Right. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, how do I get, look what it says in 15. He says, more precious than rubies. Look at 16. Length of days in her right hand and her left hand, riches and honor. 
How do I have a long life and I have enough money to get the things I need in life? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek the wisdom of God that's found by keeping his commandments and staying away from evil. Long life and riches can be added if you're in the will of God. And look, you know, if God's not giving you riches, then maybe, maybe you need to check yourself. Maybe God looks down and says, well, I would, but you would destroy yourself. I love you too much to let you have a lot of money because you would end up destroying yourself. You wouldn't serve me. You'd go do something else. Consider that. I mean, look, God's going to give you exactly, hey, feed me with food that's convenient for me. That ought to be your prayer. Lord, give me what I can handle and nothing more. Make sure I can serve you. Make sure I can be good to my family. Don't give me anything that's going to take me away from you or my family. Lord, that's my prayer. That's what wisdom is. True wisdom is having goals that are godly. True goals that are spiritual. And we see that through the eyes of God here in the book of Proverbs. Look at verse number 18. When he said length of days, he follows up with this in verse 18. She, that's wisdom, is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. And happy is every one that retaineth her. Now look, wisdom here is a tree of life. This is not the tree of life that we see in the book of Genesis and in the book of Revelation and, and in Ezekiel. And, you know, this is just a tree of life, a tree that sustains life is what it's giving us the symbology of here. This is mentioned several times in the book of Proverbs. And you think about a tree of life, it's going to produce knowledge of God. It's going to produce some health for you, right? It's going to give you some things. In Proverbs 11.30, you all probably know this, the fruit of the righteous is, again, a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. So first, a tree of life is wisdom. Then here, it's those that are wise unto soul winning. He that winneth souls is wise, right? The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. When you go out soul winning, and you're reproducing yourself, and you're a tree that bears fruit, and that fruit becomes another tree, and that tree may bear its own fruit, right? That is the tree of the righteous. And what is its wisdom? What is this tree of life in Proverbs 11? It is the wisdom to go out soul winning, to search for others, to tell others of God's salvation. In Proverbs 13, verse 12, it says, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Hope deferred is you get, you get your hopes up for something, right? Now, our spiritual hope is really in the resurrection. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ bringing our salvation to fruition, right? There's more things yet to happen. But, you know, hope deferred. One time I was at the house and, you know, we share a vehicle. And my wife was out doing some stuff. And, and I told her, you know, well, come home and I'm going to treat you to lunch. And I sat and I waited and I looked out the window and I got everything ready. And I went out the front door and she's not there. Hope deferred. Oh, man. When's she going to get here? You know? But when she got there, I was excited. Right? It gave me some invigoration. It, gave, it quickened me a little bit. And I think when he hope deferred, make it the heart sick. But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Look, when we desire blessings from the Lord, when we get them from the Lord, it reinvigorates us. Just like the soul winning. When you get somebody saved and you're seeing things happen, you're getting them to come to church or to get baptized, or you see, man, that's, I was just praying for an answer to this, and then here you are. Man, that feels good, doesn't it? To be used of the Lord, to know that God is using you and that that's all you want to do, and God gave you that opportunity to be used of Him to spread His Word. In Proverbs 15, he says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. He's saying a tongue that is wholesome, that's uplifting, that's like speaking life into people. Elsewhere in Proverbs it says that there is the power of death and life in your tongue. You have the power to destroy people with your tongue. You have the power to speak life into them and encourage them and edify them, build them up and help them be better people. So when he says that the the a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Look, there are people out there with a filthy mouth and a bad attitude, and, and all they're doing is speaking death. Yeah. And he doesn't even compare it to a tree of death. That wouldn't even make sense. That's a dead tree. There's nothing to it. There's no root. There's no fruit, right? But thank God we have God's Holy Spirit in us and the wisdom to be a tree of life to other people by soul winning, by having an encouraging tongue. And we have that tree of life of wisdom that we can lay hold on, that will give us length of days, that will help us be 
more intelligent people. I do believe that once you're saved, if you start reading the Bible, you will be a more intelligent person. I believe your IQ will increase. And don't ask for scientific results. That's just, that's my opinion. That's faith on the Word of God because I believe wisdom is greater than earthly knowledge. Because a lot of earthly knowledge comes, I mean, you look at what these scientists come up with these days. It's pretty retarded stuff. Look at verse number 19, Proverbs 3, verse 19. It says, The Lord, by wisdom, hath founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. Right? It's talking about the creation of the heaven and the earth. Guess what? The Bible teaches God's the creator. You know, now, this should be a no-brainer. You know, we, look, we, we recently preached a sermon about evolution, that evil religion of evolution. And I showed you from Genesis. And I gave you, he said, day one he did this. They said, six billion years ago this happened, right? Day two, God did this, is what the Bible says. Well, five billion years ago this. You know, day three, well, four billion years ago. All right, they're fools. And what's funny is their system is a mock of God. They do it in the same order. If you don't believe me, go to Wikipedia and look at the order. Open any textbook. Look at the order of how they say things evolved. And it's going to line up with Genesis 1. But God is right. I have more faith in the Lord Jesus Christ than all of the science textbooks. I mean, they create their own system. They test each other based on that system. Well done. I'll call you a master. Good job. Right? But this is a no-brainer for a creation verse. I'm going to read it again. Verse 19. Proverbs 3.19. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down dew. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 1. So here, here's a cool little nugget, a creation verse in the middle of Proverbs. I guess what? They're all throughout the Bible. God created the heaven and the earth. That's that's a no-brainer. People should know this. Everybody knows it in their heart, whether they want to admit they believe it or not. You know, they are guilty by what's evident to them. What they can see in nature proves God to them. So they can't just deny God. They can't, you know, the Bible says they are without excuse. So they are guilty to admit their creator. And if they want to harden their heart to God's record, they can. But, you know, it's funny because there are a lot of, there's these liberal Baptists, that don't want to believe the, the creation record, right? The Pope, the Catholic Church, this Jesuit Pope, says he believes that evolution and, and, and the Bible can, can go hand in hand, right? What's he saying? He doesn't believe in Genesis 1-1. Yep. But, you know, I mean, that's, we all know that there's a problem with the Catholics and the Pope. Look, the Bible says a literal six days, not six billion years. But, you know, there's a problem also with independent, fundamental, so-called Baptist churches, especially these Ruckmanites, that they teach the same thing. They teach that evolution and creation can go hand in hand. I want you to look at your Bible. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, did you guys see that? Did you see that in there? In between verse 1 and verse 2, people say there's 6 billion years. Are you aware of this? No, this the, it's the gap theory. Oh, it's not the gap theory, brother. It's the gap fact. Right? Peter Ruckman taught this strange heresy. I have one of his, his Bibles, and, and he's got just uh, it, it, some of the stupidest things I've ever seen in a Bible in the footnotes are coming out of this man. So does this guy. There's a guy across the river here in Jacksonville. His name is uh, David. He's a clown. His name is David Peacock. Who knows what I'm talking about? Right? This guy teaches this gap theory, the gap fact. Right? Billions and billions of years could have been, you know, spliced in there. Is that what the Bible says? Well, I don't know that that's what it says. Are you sure about? Well, that's it. Could be. He's got all these strange things that he, uh, pardon me, it's Dr. David Peacock, he's a bachelor in divinity, he has his, his theological masters, and his theological doctorate. Oh, he is somebody. All of that, and he looks at Genesis 1, and he says there's a period there, and then the next word it says, and, therefore there must be six billion years in between there. This man is a fool. This man, he, he is, 
deceiving people. Yeah. He, oh, he's a self-proclaimed doctor. He's given doctorates out to people. He's got his own Bible college. Look, this guy is unsaved. He is a heretic. He preached a sermon years ago called Real Repentance, where he basically says, oh, of course it's by faith alone, but I mean, if you really repented, you're going to do the works. We're going to see that lifestyle. Of course these Ruckmanites preach, repent of your sins, lordship, salvation, garbage. Look, there are some strange people in Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. This David Peacock is one of them. He is one of the goofiest guys I've ever seen. He's, he preaches and teaches some strange doctrine. And this is the fruit of dispensationalism. Yeah. This is the poster child of dispensationalism. This guy that gets to the first verse and says, what God said here isn't true. Don't you know it's a fact that there's billions and billions of years in here? Because I can't answer some evolutionist. Hey, either believe God's record or believe man's record. Don't mix the two. Right, right. This guy's an unsaved heretic. Him and all of his buddies, these, these dipsticks, these dispensationalists, Al Lacey, unsaved heretic, repent of your sins. Same thing with Peter Ruckman, Sam Gipp, unsaved, total heretic. The man has a devil. When the things they say about the Lord Jesus Christ, it's clear they're not saved. Charles Lawson, unsaved. Lester Roloff, unsaved. Phil Kidd, unsaved. Well, you're talking about all the old IFB greats. I don't care who they are. When they say you have to repent of your sins, you're not saved. Amen. That is not what the Bible teaches. They're lying about the creation record because they want to believe Peter Ruckman or Schofield or Darby, some unsaved heretic. Yeah, right. Look, it should be clear. The children can understand when the Bible says that God created the heaven and the earth that he did it. It should be clear that when he says he did it in six days, that doesn't mean six billion years. Yeah. Only a fool would proclaim such a doctrine. Absolutely. Now go back to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Look at verse number 21. So here we're speaking of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, right? Verse 19, we'll back up a second. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth by understanding. He hath established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up. Again, those three are going to be paired all throughout Proverbs. So when we hit 21, my son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Right? How do we be more discreet as a person? Keep these things. Keep that wisdom that you, when you see it, Hold on to it. Don't just let it go. Hold on to it. Verse 22. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Wisdom will be life unto your soul. It will keep you alive on this earth and it will take you on to heaven and new, the new heaven and new earth. Now the next few verses, 23 through 26, all work together. We're going to read them all the way through and then take a step back. Look at verse 23. Then shalt thou walk in the way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. Look, here's the answer. For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. This is what I tell the preachers. You men, you want to preach on a men's preaching night and you haven't done it yet, you're not sure. Maybe you have and you're trying to figure out how to get better at it. The Lord shall be thy confidence. If your attitude is humble before the Lord, not, hey, I want to get up here and show everybody what I got. You've already failed. Yeah. Don't be confident in yourself. Be confident in the Lord. If you'll humble yourself and say, Lord, what can I do to help your people, your people, church that you've brought me to, Lord, what can I do to help your church? Uh, my confidence is that God's going to give me the words to help you. And when you get up here and preach, men, it's the same thing. Ladies, when you go out soul winning, when you witness to your family, let the Lord be thy confidence. I mean, you can call it a crutch if you want. That's something you're leaning on. You can call it, I mean, think about it. whatever it takes to, to draw this picture mentally. Let the Lord be the one that holds you up gives you the life, gives you the breath, gives you the words. Because that's the whole message here. Look, at, look back at 23. Remembering that, that if the Lord is thy confidence, verse 23, then shalt thou walk in the way safely. 
and thy foot shall not stumble. You know, the Bible says to consider your steps. Years ago, I lived in these apartments, and there was, it was upstairs, and every time I'd get home, I would just run up the stairs as fast as I could. I didn't waste any time getting up. And I had been meditating on that verse about, you know, your steps and walking with the Lord. And, you know, as the brain tries to work out what this all means, I'm asking, Lord, I don't entirely get this. And, you know, Lord, help me understand what it means to consider my step and to walk in the way with you, right? And to walk in thy way safely here. And one day I'm running up and I slip. And I come this close to, to like seriously hurting myself, busting my face on these metal and concrete steps. And it was like, as I'm falling, as I'm slipping, I say, Lord, help me. Just that quick, just in my heart. It was a habit. Instead of what the world wants to say, you know, throw off some little four-letter word, Lord, help me. Right? Men, you're preaching. You need some help. Hey, ladies, you're out soul winning. Lord, help me. Lord, give me the words. You're my confidence. I can't do it without you. Well, I almost hit. And I, Lord, help me. And I'm like, oh, I should pray for every step. Right? Every time I went up the steps afterwards, I was praying for every step. Lord, help me to get up here real quick. Lord, help me to get in the door. You know, help, you know, I mean, you think about it. That's how the confidence we ought to have in the Lord is that we're asking Him for every moment, for every step, for every breath, for every word, for everything we do in the day. We want God to be right there with us. He's promised He will be, but are you, are you using Him? Are you using it? You know, I mean, if, if you had a boss that said, you know, I'm, I'm here to help anybody, and you get in a, in a jam where you need, really need some help, well, I won't call the boss. He's too busy. He's sitting in the work truck, and, and he's ready to help you, right? All you had to do is pick up the phone. It's the same way with God, only greater. God's right there. He wants to help you. He wants you to ask, and he's given us his power, and so many Christians don't use it. We're not praying without ceasing. We're not considering every step. Look, if the Lord is our confidence, look at verse 24. It says, when thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. If the Lord is your confidence when you lay down at night, well, I just don't know. I'm worried about that kid. That kid's sick. We're worried about the baby. I don't know what we're going to do. You know what? The Lord is my confidence. Lord, I put it in your hands. Well, I don't know about the bills. I mean, that, that power bill was twice as much this month, and I'm not sure what we're going to do. Lord, uh, can I do this? Can, is it going to work? You know what? Not my responsibility. I'm going to delegate this to my provider. I'm going to say the Lord is my confidence that everything's going to work out. And I'm going to roll over and go to sleep. Look at the next verse, 25. If the Lord be thy confidence, be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Look, when you're out in the ghetto soul winning, you have nothing to be afraid of. God is with you. And if you're not in the ghetto and, you're in, and something's going down, hey, you have nothing to be afraid of. God is with you. Amen. Ladies, if, you're, if your husband's, you know, going in and out of traffic, all right, don't give him a hard time. You have nothing to be afraid of if, if the Lord be thy confidence, Amen. all right? <laughs> Look, the goal here is that we all learn to trust in the Lord a little bit more in every aspect of life. He's so much bigger than us. He can protect, I mean, he can start the ball rolling of something to happen years from now to, to fix a problem that you have. Some little problem. He, he can give you green lights instead of red lights. And you know what? If, if you get a red light, look, God's curse isn't on you. But the goal is that you're trusting the Lord. Be okay with the red light. Be okay with going, be okay with, you know, having some bills that are a little bit behind. You know what? The Lord's my confidence. As long as I have my family, I could care less whether my credit score dips a little. Seriously. These are the things that matter in life. Look at verse 27. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Right? Withhold not good. I, I believe also you should praise somebody when they do something that's right. If somebody does a good job, I let them know. We had a couple of young ladies that did the offertory last week or the week before. I went and let them know they did a good job. They played well. They were confident. It came out great. Praise the Lord. We should encourage them and say, hey, good job. Keep it up, right? Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thy hand to do it. If you have the ability to be a blessing to somebody, don't hold off. You have nothing to be afraid. Well, but what if I lose? Hey, God will give you so much more. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You think, he, I mean, so oh, I'm, I'm just running short. I don't know what to hear. Here's five bucks. Are you sure? Yeah, take, I mean, come on. 
think about it as, as brothers, because this is for, for brothers and sisters. We need to help each other. Look at the next verse. Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee. If you've got it, give it to him then. Don't hesitate, because in the same way, when you need something, when you need a blessing, when you need somebody else to make a decision for you, what if it's a mirror? What if it's reversed? And you're, well, they had the ability. They could have done it right there, but they didn't do it. You know, in, in James 2, it says, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute, destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? What he's saying is, if somebody comes to me and says, Brother Fanny, I don't know where the next meal's coming from. Things are just that bad, and I am working, and I'm not drinking, and I'm, I'm trying to do it right, and I don't know what it is. Well, hey, well, that's an opportunity for me to be a personal blessing to them. I need to take that opportunity. Right? And look, churches are not a charity. Every week I get people, I just had one yesterday, dialing for dollars. These, these homeless people, these heroin addicts, these total bums, these leeches that refuse to work, they call up every single church in the phone book or on Google Maps, and they'll even tell you that's what they're doing, and they're asking everybody for a little bit of money. Well, you know, you know, my boyfriend didn't pay the JEA power bill, and he ran off, and I got, you know, that's not my problem. That is not the church's problem either. The church, yeah, hey, as a, a group of people, we're here to help these people. Oh, did you come to church? Do I know you? Were you at church on Sunday? No, I don't go to church. Okay, well, come to church and I'll feed you. Silence. Hey, hey, is this Steadfast Church? Do you guys buy hotel rooms? Why? So you can not work and lay up and do heroin? No! It's getting bad. I mean, there, I'm telling you, every single week we're getting calls from people just begging, asking for something. That's not the purpose of the church. And those same people, whether you give it to them or not, they're going to badmouth you. They're going to badmouth your church. But if your brother or sister be naked or destitute of food, don't say, well, be warm, be filled. Right? If you have it, don't say, go and come again. Oh, you need some sugar? Well, we've got some. I don't know if we're going to use it tonight. Come back tomorrow. That wouldn't be right. Here, take all we've got. We probably won't even use it for another week. I mean, seriously, God will give you so much more, especially when you're willing. Hey, you know what? Here you go. When your heart is right to please the Lord, he will, you can't stop his blessing. He will overflow you. Look at, look at verse 29. Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. Listen, as Christians in this world, we need to make sure we're not taking part in plotting against neighbors or, hey, hey let's get together and call the neighborhood association because of that guy's lawn. Let's just go mow the lawn for him. Right? Be a real Christian. Just Who cares? It's ten, you know, an extra hour of my life, and I've earned a friend. It's worth it. I'll do it. Instead, you know what the attitude is? Well, those people, they play their music. We should tell everybody else. Think about it. We shouldn't, we shouldn't make enemies of our neighbors. We shouldn't devise evil against them. You know, not for land or for a fence or for grass or, or noise or any of that. You know, be at peace with your neighbors. And look, if there's a problem, deal with it. Don't just lay down and let them roll over you, right? Protect your own and, and stand up for what's right. And don't let their wickedness, you know, come into your house. You need to, to take care of business. But he's saying here that we need to be peacemakers. Blessed be the peacemakers. Look at the next verse. He says, strive not with a man without cause. If he have done thee no harm. You know, as I was studying for this verse, I thought I might have preached this last week. But obviously we didn't. We, we ran out of time. But last week, I was out walking Naomi, and one of the neighbor ladies starts asking, oh, I've heard about the baby, but I haven't met this. Who's this? And, and she starts talking, and she's older. And then, and she's, okay, so where's your church? So I guess, I guess word gets around the neighborhood, right? And I haven't met her before. So where's your church at? So I start telling her where we're at. Oh, okay. Well, so it's Baptist. Well, I, I used to be Baptist. And I said, oh, okay. Well, why'd you stop? Why aren't you Baptist now? Well, you're not going to believe it. This Baptist church, they somehow found out that my son was gay, and they said they didn't want him in the Sunday school anymore. Now, now look. Sounds like a decent church. Uh, yeah, sounds like a like. Where's this church at, man? Wow, you know. Now, now, mind you, this was probably 40 years ago. All right, she was a much older lady. I'm thinking, 
Churches used to do it right, but that same church today, I guarantee you they would be the first ones to hang that little fag flag, and you know what I mean? They'd be the first ones, oh, we're praying for, no, you idiots, right? I could have blasted her. I could, you know, well, you know what? The Bible says your son's filthy. He should, she's my neighbor. Now, she's down the road. She's never going to come to our church. Is there a good reason for me to correct her doctrine? Or is it better for me just to just be at peace with her? Yep. Wow, they did that. Cool. <laughs> you know? And then she starts telling me about the liberal church she goes to now. They're non-denominational, I think. <laughs> I'm thinking, no, they're not. Actually, it's on their sign. <laughs> Idiot. Anyway. <laughs> There's no reason, like he says, strive not with a man without a cause. There's no cause for me to pick a fight with that little old lady. And sometimes in life there's opportunities for us to strive when really it's not worth it. Pick your battles. Yeah. Right? Jesus said, you know, would be angry to not, not to be angry without a cause. Same concept. If there if you can accomplish it without being angry or striving with somebody, let it go. Let it slide. Blessed be the peacemakers, yeah. right? Let you've got true joy, right? And a lot of times the things in life, they get us worked up. Well, but my neighbor in that fence, if we don't get it solved, then what? It's not eternal. They're not going to last forever. You're not going to be there forever. Let it go. Be man enough to let something go and, and pick your fights. And, make, and, you know, don't make enemies of your neighbors. That's a, a Christian principle, Old and New Testament. You would be wise to make friends of your neighbors. There's another neighbor in particular... He, he's an atheist and he wants you to know it. Nice guy. He and I both worked in data fields so we can talk. We speak geek. You know, we can talk about things. And one day I had a problem with my lawnmower. And he came over and mowed my whole lawn and the back. Didn't have to do it. Why? Because I made friends with him. I said, well, you know what? He's told me about all the problems he's had with churches. And I just bit my lip. I still try to give him the gospel. I still try to, you know, he don't want to hear it. Well, that don't mean I have to make him my enemy. I still want to be at peace because maybe there's a day coming where something bad happens in his life. Maybe he'll be laid up in the hospital bed. Maybe his wife will die. And then all of a sudden you'll hear what I have to say. I'm not praying for devastation in his life. I'm praying for an opportunity to be a blessing. So pick your battles. There's no, no need in being an, an enemy or an angry person with people, striving with people without a cause. Look at verse 31. Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. Now, envy is similar to jealousy, but envy is more covetous. Envying is wanting something that is not yours. As, as a husband, you should be jealous over your wife. God is jealous over you. You belong to him. Envious is something like coveting something that's not yours, desiring something. Who says, envy not thou oppressor, and choose none of his ways. In Proverbs 23, it says, Let not thine heart envy sinners. Be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Listen, when you see the prosperity of the wicked, don't desire that. Don't covet it. Don't envy a lifestyle that somebody else has. Don't envy that vehicle that you just can't help but look at. Man, but it's got that extra. It's got this. It's got that. Don't envy anything they have. They are not at peace. They don't have any joy. They have an appearance. They just have the appearance of being something, and it's absolutely nothing. Look, there are flowers that people plant. They buy them, and they plant them in their yard, but yet they grow wild as a weed. And that's, kind of, that's like the envy of the wicked. You don't envy that lifestyle. It is hollow. It's vain. It's empty. It's pointless. It's like a weed growing on the fence, and somebody's trying to sell it to you. Don't buy that. You don't need that lifestyle. You know, we need wisdom of the Lord. We need to be in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Look at verse 32. For the froward, and again, that's crooked or perverse. For the froward is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. God's secret is with the righteous. God will reveal things to you that others don't get. God will give you true joy in your heart at bad times. God wants to, God wants to actually make us happy because we love him, because we follow him, because we want his wisdom. Amen. Look, he says, the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. A lot of these people that are God-haters, that they've got all the stuff they need in life, 
mommy and daddy have really big jobs and really big cars, they're not happy. There is a curse. Their children are cursed. Their houses are cursed. And, and we don't see that. But God does, and he warns us about that. And I have seen Christians that go astray. They go off onto that path. They want to go down that way. They want to see, well, maybe I can get some of that stuff. And they're worried about stuff more than godliness. And they end up with the curse in their house. They end up losing their very children. I've seen people that claim to be Christians, and, the, and they just, well, you know, my, my daughter, just she doesn't believe in God like I do. I mean, evolution, and not just a little bit, like a God-hater. And they try to make excuse, well, it's okay, she's doing really well with her job. Yeah, how's her soul? Yeah. Worry about the soul, not the job. Right. And as Christians, we don't want that curse on our house. Look, he says, he blesseth the habitation of the just. Surely... He scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. Right? The Bible says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. God will give you grace in time of need if you're lowly, if you're meek, if you're humble, if you're seeking him, asking him to provide instead of trying to do it on your own. Last verse here. Look, he says, the wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. Now, the wise to inherit glory, I mean, you can be wise to inherit eternal glory, I think is one aspect of this. Being wise unto salvation, receiving eternal glory eventually, right? Obeying God's law, though, I think, you know, if, if you have wisdom, you will even have some glory in, in this life, too. I think it's a twofold. You know, the more that you obey God, the more he'll bless you. And the flip side of that coin, he says, the shame, he says, but shame shall be the promotion of of fools you think and that's kind of a contradiction a promotion how can shame be a promotion isn't shame you know something you know, the Bible warns that they glory in their shame they're proud of stupid things is it maybe another way to say it you think about this guy Tyler Doka his foolish views on the world his foolish views on salvation and total heresy and he's oh man all the but all the flat earthers are flocking to this guy well okay well they're not saved He's not saved. He's preaching another gospel. When he, when he brags that he's got something special, no other Christian has seen this. Hey, buddy, you're not a Christian. That's right. Why can't you figure that out? No other Christian has seen it my way up until now. You're starting to sound like a cult, my friend. Yeah. You're starting to sound like a Joseph Smith or one of these false prophets. Oh, I got some special way nobody else has ever seen. And Peter Ruckman was bad about that. You know, Tyler Baker, there's another one. He defended Peter Ruckman to me. I'm, I'm more sure that Peter Ruckman is saved than Jack Hiles. And I'm quoting Tyler Baker. Now, look, Peter Ruckman is not saved. He preaches you have to change your life. He preaches repent of your sins. He, he preaches that you are saved. There's seven different methods of salvation just in the book of Acts. It could be with baptism is necessary, with works and with faith. It could just be works and faith. It could be works, or I'm sorry, it could be faith and baptism. He's got all these strange, I mean, that guy's not saved. That's not of God. Tyler Baker, I do not think is saved either. You look at the promotion, right? He says, shame shall be the promotion of fools. I think he was a fool in his heart. And I think he puffed himself up. He was a deacon of a great church. And then, yeah, what's his promotion? Now it's shame. He had to go crawl into his daddy's church, the church that he said was a bunch of stinking losers. Yeah, some great church that would ordain you. Right? His preaching's so good, only mama can stand it. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Bunch of losers over there. And the people that are over there just coming up with stranger and stranger and stranger doctrine. It's shame. It's a folly unto them, and they don't see it. They're glorying in their shame. They're bragging about how idiotic they have become and how they're the only ones on the planet that believe this way. Check yourself. That's foolishness. Look, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up. Do it God's way. Admit that you don't know it all, but God has given you the answer book. Read the book of Proverbs and ask God to explain it to you. And be in the fear of the Lord, and you will have wisdom. That will be a tree of life that will last forever. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for Proverbs chapter 3. Lord, thank you for... Just the awesome things that have happened this year in this church, Lord. And we look forward to many more miracles happening, Lord. Lord, please help Brother Doug Pelsing. Lord, please help him recover and help him get back in this fight. Help his family. Lord, help the Dixons in this time of need with these babies. Lord, please provide health 
and length of days to these little ones. Give the parents the wisdom. Give the doctors the wisdom. Lord, we're trusting you to provide life for them. We love you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.